So let's get started. My name is Trevor. If you don't know me, I'm the lead pastor here, and I'm just I'm excited that um, you've come here this morning with us to join and just to look into God's Word. Um, something's been heavy on my heart for a while, and, and as a pastor, one of the most difficult things that you have to do is preach, of course. Uh, and, and if I said, hey, you know, who wants to come up and preach next week? Very few hands would go up, okay? So it's, it's a daunting task, but one of the biggest parts of that is deciding what to preach on. Like, like okay, I love to preach in series, so it's like, okay, what series, God, do you have for us next? And I, I know at some point he wants us to go to the book of John and just completely walk through the book of John. That will probably take me to retirement. But it just, it is what it is. Um, as I say all the time, I have the spiritual gift of stretching sermon series out way longer than they need to be, uh, but that's just me. Um, but nonetheless, I'm like, okay, God, what is it that you, you want me to preach on? What series do you want us to go in? And so we kind of did the worry and anxiety, and then we had Easter, and it rolled around to about well, right when service was over last week, and I'm like, hey, God, I really kind of need to know where we're going. And so I've, I've kind of had this idea in my head. I've had some conversations with some people, and I, I kind of had some concepts and thoughts, and then God just dropped this one word into my mind, which was like, yeah, that's it. That's the thing that's been stirring in me, and I didn't really know how to describe it, but that one word is simple. I, I, I love digging into Scripture. I mean, I love studying it. I, I love throughout the week of just my time to be able to look into God's Word. And I, I love breaking it down. And it's, there, there's some big, heavy stuff in Scripture. But I, I was just kind of thinking, what if we just looked at Scripture in a simple way? I, I, you've probably figured out already, but I'm a pretty simple guy. Like, I'm not a complicated guy. Like, like, my elevator doesn't go all the way up to the top floor all the time, okay? I like to keep cookies on the bottom shelf. So I'm like, how can we take a look into God's Word and pull out some simple, practical truths and applications in a way where we all walk away this morning and go, I know exactly what he was trying to say, I know exactly what he wanted me to get from there. And most importantly, I know exactly what I'm supposed to go do with this. That's the application part. That part is so important to me. So I want us to do this sermon series simple. Now, I don't know how long this is going to go for. I don't know. But what I want to do is each week walk through one story out of the Bible and for the most part, the well-known stories, because I think that's kind of goes along with the theme of just being able to take a story that we've probably all heard a thousand times and see, just break it completely apart and say, okay, God, what are the simple truths in here that you wanted us to see? And so that's what we're going to do. And by the way, simple doesn't mean simplistic, okay? What I want us to do is understand, God, what do you have for us in this passage here. All right, so we're going to look at today and probably most every week, three simple and applicable truths from each story. Now, it's really, really hard for me to only find three things that I want us to talk about in a story, much less to cover an entire story in one week. I can't tell you how hard this is going to be for me, but hopefully this makes sense. Does that work for you guys? Is that okay? I mean, if you tell me something different, I can change it right now. No. So here we go. Simple, David and Goliath. It's probably a good place to start, right? If we're starting with the simple stories, we all know. Yeah, but, 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 but Trev... David and Goliath is a kid's story, right? I won't make you raise your hand, but probably some of us, as I would have, thought that. David and Goliath is like, you know, what you tell with kids. So if you've got your Bibles, 1 Samuel 17. If you don't have a Bible, there's going to be one right there in front of you. If you don't own a Bible, you are welcome to take that Bible home with you. That's our gift to you this morning. Uh, otherwise, you can just look up on the screen. All the words are going to be up there on the screen for you. So in 1 Samuel 7, uh, 17, 
David and Goliath is this iconic, well-known story that's, that's often used um, to show like um, this story between, you know, this small thing. And often the world kind of hijacks biblical stuff, right? I love it when I see that. It's like, you know, there was this small startup, this little tech startup, and they went up against Google and, well, true story, they would have got demolished. But nonetheless, you know, like, okay, the startup took over Google and it was a true David and Goliath story, right? We hear that all the time. And so it's this, even, even though the world sees it, we know it as the concept of David and Goliath. But the actual biblical account of David and Goliath, and, and we've probably never thought about this before, but it's a little bit unusual in Scripture, and, and, and the reason why I say that is because in the Old Testament, not always did the writers give so many details and, and, and just so many just little intricate little things, and they, they don't normally draw it out that much. So it's like the writer of this story has so much for us to get from this story, again, that we just think, oh, it's just a kid's story. Like, like, like if I flipped a coin, probably there's David and Goliath uh, in, in the back in one of the kid's um, classes. That's just how common we think it is. So 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 1, it says, Now the Philistines gathered their forces for war, and assembled at Soko in Judah. Now, interesting, important to understand, the Philistines were like the mortal enemies of Israel. They were like, when, when, when you said Philistine around the Israelites, they probably just grumbled and went, oh, you know, those are the bad guys. But it's important here to understand what's happening. Israel, when they went into the promised land, they were told to go and conquer territories. That's not what was happening here. This was an invasion. This was an invasion of the Philistine army. And by the way, the Philistines, as most of us know, were, were giants. They were, they were bigger. They weren't like, you know, super crazy big, but they were much bigger than everybody else. So here we have the mortal enemy coming into Israel, into Judah, and trying to take out the Israelites. Verse 2, Saul and the Israelites assembled and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up their battle line to meet the Philistines. The Philistines occupied one hill and the Israelites another with the valley between them. A champion named Goliath, who was from Gath, came out of the Philistine camp. His height was six cubits in a span. That's over nine feet tall. This was a big guy. He had a bronze helmet on his head and wore a coat of scale armor of bronze weighing 5,000 shekels. That's armor weighing about 125 pounds. On his legs, he wore bronze greaves, and a bronze javelin was slung on his back. His spear shaft was like a weaver's rod, and its, point, its iron point weighed 600 shekels. Okay, going to be a little graphic here, okay? But I think that's exactly what the writer is doing and what he wants us to understand. Okay, 125 pounds of armor over nine feet tall, this big iron helmet. But it gives us this detail about the shaft of his spear. Just the tip of his spear weighed 15 pounds. Okay, now, when you picture a gun and a bullet traveling through something, a bullet weighs what? An ounce, maybe a couple of ounces? And how much damage that can do? Think about a 15-pound spear point being thrust through someone and then pulled back out. Sorry to be graphic, but that's exactly what the writer is trying to get us to understand the gravity of this situation. This dude is monstrous. He is scary. And the Israelites are, are trembling, as we're going to see here. But again, this much detail in the Old Testament was not at least at this point, wasn't very common. And it gives us four verses just about Goliath to draw us in. Because at this point, we're all going, oh my goodness, this dude, if you're picturing this guy, Goliath, not like the kid's stories, but like what he actually would have looked like if you were going against him in battle is absolutely frightening. By the way, size and strength don't matter. 
when God is on your side. You know that, right? Like size and strength, so what? When God's involved, size and strength do not matter. Verse 8. Goliath stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why do you come out and line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man and have him come down to me. If he is able to fight and kill me, we will become your subjects. But if I overcome him and kill him, you will become our subjects and serve us. So here's Goliath trying to engage in what's called single combat or champion warfare. It was something that was really just starting in that time. And it was, hey, send a representative out. We'll just battle this mano e mano. And whoever wins, the whole army wins. No, no reason for us to shed all of this blood right here. Let's just do it one-on-one style. Verse 10. Then the Philistine said, this day I defy the armies of Israel. Give me a man and let us fight each other. On hearing the Philistines' words, Saul and all the Israelites were dismayed and terrified. Notice it mentions Saul. It says Saul and all the Israelites. It's really, he could have just said everybody was terrified and that would have included Saul. But the fact that he said Saul and all the Israelites... What do we know about Saul? What was one of the reasons why he was chosen? Or at least what was one of the descriptions that it said about Saul? It said he was head and shoulders above everyone else in the land. Saul is their biggest, strongest leader. And the writer here wants us to understand that even their king, the guy that was supposed to lead the charge into battle, was terrified at this guy. That's how dire the situation is. Verse 12. Now David was the son of an Ephrathite named Jesse, who was from Bethlehem in Judah. Now, here's another one of those things where normally if you're reading, you would just read right over it and not think any, okay, that's just part of his lineage, great. Well, what does that mean he was the son of an Ephrathite? Well, uh, Ephra or Ephrata was his great, 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 a whole bunch of greats, grandma. And she was married to Caleb the warrior. So he is of this lineage of warriors. And the writer wants us to know, hey, listen, I, I, I know All you know about David so far is he's a shepherd boy, but there is greatness in him. There is warrior in him. Remember, just the chapter before, chapter 16, we see he's anointed as king. But remember Samuel the prophet went to Jesse's house, David's father, and he said, hey, I know God is going to anoint one of your sons, so bring all of your sons here, and God's going to tell me who it is that I'm supposed to anoint. And what did Jesse do? He brought all of his sons in except for one. Like, Like David didn't even get an invite David's still out in the field, and, and, and Samuel walks by. He's like, Eliab, nope, 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 nope. And he goes through all of the sons, and, and God doesn't tell him, hey, this is the one. And he's like, wait a minute. It, God told me one of your sons. Is this all your sons? And Jesse's like, well, I mean, you know, there's one other, but, you know, I mean, he's like out in the field with his sheep, and he's, you know, he's little. And so and, uh, he's like, all right, bring him here. He gets anointed. That's all we know about David so far in this story. And then the writer says, he's the son of an Ephraite. There's this greatness inside of him because of his ancestry. And guess what, Christian? There is greatness in you because of who your heavenly father is. It says, Jesse had eight sons, and in Saul's time, he was very old. Jesse's three oldest sons had followed Saul to the war. The firstborn was Eliab, the second Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. The three oldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward every morning and evening and took his stand. Now, this is strange to me. Remember, the Philistines are invading the land. 
Why did the Philistines stop there and for 40 days taunt them? Why? I don't know either, okay? I was hoping maybe one of you guys knew. I don't know. Except that maybe God had this plan where he was going to send this little shepherd boy because nothing else makes sense of why they would have stopped there when the Philistines know they are just going to mow over the Israelites. Verse 17. Now Jesse said to his son David, take this ephah of roasted grain and these 10 loaves of bread for your brothers and hurry to their camp. Take along these 10 cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. Now, David, like we said, anointed king The last chapter, chapter 16, anointed a king, but does he arrive at the battle looking like a king? What what, what does he look like? He's delivering cheese. He's practically Uber Eats, okay? And he arrives at this battle knowing he is the anointed king, but he's still faithful. I wonder how it felt for David in that time. I wonder what would go through his mind knowing that God had chosen him for a king, but seeing Saul, seeing this battle, knowing he wasn't ready, but all of those years, I wonder what that was like. You know, Scripture kind of calls that in the waiting. Knowing that God has something great for you. You don't really know exactly what it is. You know you're supposed to be doing something, but like, like you, you don't know exactly, but and God, but you've, you've, you're in the waiting. I've been in the waiting before. Um, for many years, I was a, a carpet cleaner. Okay. Most of you guys know this. I worked for Isla Mirada Cleaners and, and I loved it. I did it for a lot of years, but for years I knew God had something different for me. I knew that God was calling me into full-time ministry. Now, I was a youth pastor at the time. I worked here at Island Community Church for several of those years, okay? But I still did carpet cleaning, uh, you know, as a full-time job. By the way, if you need your carpet or your tile and grout or your furniture clean, call Island Rotted Cleaners, okay? Uh, Michael and Jessica actually own Island Rotted Cleaners now. Just a little commercial there. Um, But for years, I am dragging a carpet wand, listening to podcasts and sermons, knowing that God has called me to full-time ministry. And I'm waiting for this opportunity. I'm I'm waiting for, okay, God, now, show it to me now that I'm supposed to just, that's, this is what I want to do, God. Yes, I'm answering your call. And for years, I was in the waiting. But God wasn't done with me yet. And and probably a better way to say is I wasn't ready yet. I still had to finish my degree. I still had to mature. I still had to get some more part-time experience, although there's no such thing as part-time student ministry. It's just part-time pay. Right, Jake? Yeah. (laughs) He's full-time, by the way. Don't, Don't judge. But here's David rolling up to the battle as the anointed king, delivering bread and cheese. How humiliating, right? Except, number one, simple followers of God choose obedience over status. Here's one of our big three points right here. Simple followers of God, and just, again, simple doesn't mean simplistic. If you want to just strip down to the basics of God, what am I supposed to do? I don't get all the Bible. Guess what? I don't get all the Bible. Okay? I don't understand a lot of things. But God, I understand that I need to choose obedience over status. Obedience over what feels good. Obedience over anything. Obedience is always the most important thing. Simple followers of God choose obedience over status. I don't know what that looks like in your life. I I, I don't know how that translates. Maybe you're like, 
I know the thing that I need to be obedient in, and I just, I, I, I haven't taken that step yet. I'll tell you, if you don't know what it is and you pray that God reveals it to you, I bet you he will, or he'll start to. It may not be right away, but I, that's a prayer that God wants to answer. God, how can I be obedient fully, not just dipping my toes in the water, not just sitting on the side of the pool and hanging my legs in, but fully jump into the deep end, be obedient to you, God. God's gonna show you if you ask. Verse 18, take along these 10 cheeses to the commander of their unit. See how your brothers are and bring back some assurance from them. They are with Saul and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elah fighting against the Philistines. Early in the morning, David left the flock in the care of a shepherd, loaded up and set out as Jesse had directed. He reached the camp as the army was going out to its battle positions, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines were drawing up their lines facing each other. David left his things with the keeper of supplies, ran to the battle lines, and asked his brothers how they were. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, stepped out from his lines and shouted his usual defiance, and David heard it. Whenever the Israelites saw the man, they all fled from him in great fear. Now the Israelites had been saying, do you see how this man keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will give great wealth to the man who kills him. He will also give him his daughter in marriage and will exempt his family from taxes in Israel. Like there would be enough reason right there, right? Verse 26, David asked the men standing near him. It's kind of timely, isn't it? Uh, what will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and removes this disgrace from Israel? This is so important. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Again, here's one of those things that are so important to realize that we would have just read and passed right over. This is the very first time we hear David speak. It's the very first time that the anointed king of Israel, not quite king yet, got a ways to go, but his very first time that he speaks, he does something very, very important. He sees a worldly problem, a big problem, a giant problem. And what does he do? He looks at it through a theological lens. Church, what would it look like if that's how we approached every problem in life? Yeah, that we, we've got problems, we've got issues, we've, we've got struggles, we've got all of that. What if we looked at those problems every single time through a theological lens? God, I've got a problem, I need your help. I want to obey you. What is it that you want me to do in this situation? God, help me not to keep my eyes focused on my problems. Help me to keep my eyes focused on you. Number two, simple followers of God choose faith over fear. Every time. We've talked a lot about fear and anxiety and worry recently. We shouldn't have to spend a whole lot of time here. But whenever we see a problem in life, whenever we have a tendency to be afraid, we should always choose faith over that fear. God, it's scary. It's a problem. It hurts. It's, I, I, I don't know how I'm going to get through it except you, God. Help me to see my problems through a theological lens just like David did. Simple followers, God, choose faith over fear. And instead of looking at Goliath's size or his technologically advanced weaponry or his years in battle, as Scripture calls him, the champion. That, that word champion, actually, the, the original word means man in between. And it means a man that goes and stands in between armies, like to go fight as the representative. But instead of seeing those things, David looks at the size of his God and the promise that God has made to protect Israel. Man, 
What a better way to look at life, isn't it, church? What if we did that? What if every time we saw a problem, we said, hey, I've got a bigger God. Uh, Yep, I've got a bigger God. Verse 27, they repeated to him what they had been saying and told him, this is what will be done for the man who kills him. When Eliab, David's oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, he burned with anger at him and asked, why have you come down here? And with whom did you leave those few sheep in the wilderness? I know how conceited you are and how wicked your heart is. You came down only to watch the battle. That was nasty, unwarranted, and out of complete jealousy, wasn't it? Because Eliab knew that he got passed over and his little runt of a brother, David, was chosen to be king. <laughs> I wonder why God didn't pick him. <laughs> hmm. Now see, here's the part in the story where I would have looked at Eliab and I would have let him have it. You know why? Because I would have been completely right. And David's heart was not wrong. David had no ill intentions about this. And if it were me, man, I would have just laid into my brother so much and I would have been 100% right. But guess what? Hmm. I would have been wrong, wouldn't I? Watch how David responds. Now what have I done, said David? Can't I even speak? Now watch this. He then, what are those next two words? Turned away. That's some pretty good advice, isn't it? He then turned away to someone else and brought up the same matter. And the men answered him as before. What David said was overheard and reported to Saul, and Saul sent for him. Did you know that you don't have to fight every battle that comes your way? no matter how right you might be. Did you know that? You don't don't have to fight every battle. If a battle comes your way, guess what? You have the option to just turn away. You have the option to just say, you know what? God's got something bigger for me. You don't have to fight every battle that comes your way, no matter how right you may be, And don't get caught up in the wrong battles. I think that is a word for not just somebody, but a lot of us this morning. Don't get caught up in the wrong battles. Don't don't see an opportunity. And again, you might be 100% right. And what would have happened if David would have jumped into that fight? He would have been distracted. His heart may have been turned at that point because he probably would have then gotten angry at his brother. And would he be in the right position to go fight a giant? Verse 32, David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. What a ridiculous, arrogant statement. Unless you knew that God was the weapon you are bringing into this battle. (laughs) King, king, don't worry, bro. I got this. Don't, don't, Don't lose heart. You don't have anything to worry about. What in the world are you talking about, David? How could David say that? Because David knew God was his weapon. Verse 32, David said to Saul, let no one lose heart on account of this Philistine. Your servant will go and fight him. Saul replied, you are not able to go against this Philistine and fight him. You are only a young man, and he has been a warrior from his youth. Now, those words, young man and youth, it's the same word. Saul's doing a little play on here. He's like, okay, as, as, you, as old as you are now, David, like ever since Goliath was that age, which, by the way, he was a teenager, 
Goliath's been a champion. He's been fighting since then. So he's got decades of fighting experience, and, and you're just a kid. He's been fighting ever since he was a kid. David, what are you thinking? You're going to get obliterated out there, right? I mean, like, like Saul is going, what on earth are you talking about? Verse 34, but David said to Saul, ready? Super strong argument right here. Your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. Listen, Saul, I don't know how to tell you this, but I've been hanging out with fluffy animals and delivering cheese. I got this. Not a super strong start for David, right? But David said to Saul, your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock, I went after it, struck it, and rescued the sheep from its mouth. When it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it, and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hand of this Philistine. Y'all want me to translate that line for you? Here's what he was saying. I have confidence in the present because of God's faithfulness in the past. That's what David was saying. David was like, listen, Saul, I, okay, okay, Philistine, giant, champion. I, I get it, I get it, I get it, okay? Okay, but there's the taxes thing. But, but I, I understand. I understand the gravity of the situation. But I need you to know, like, I've been in some sketchy situations before. Like, I'm a shepherd, and I have to stay the night with my sheep, like, like out in the wilderness by myself. And, and, and King Saul, I had lions and bears come and take my sheep, and, and I didn't cower away. Like, like that, that was, that was, that, that's one of my sheep. I went after it, like I struck the lion, I wrestled it, I grabbed it by its hair, and I wrestled it down, and I killed that. Lions, bears, I've got them. Guess what? And, and, and that was just me fighting for sheep. This is me fighting for Israel. God's got me. H haven't you read the scriptures, King Saul? Like God's going to rescue me. How are we going to allow this uncircumcised Philistine to defy the armies of the living God? By the way... This was probably the first time that David ever heard anyone curse God or Israel. And David, this man after God's own heart, just a teenager, was like, how are we allowing this? Why hasn't somebody stepped up and done something? He's cursing God. Why are we letting him do this? This is not right. Somebody's got to do something. If you're not going to do it, I'll do it. Can you imagine the confidence that David had in this? He must have been pretty convincing because the next verse says, Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. Like, okay, I know it's the fate of uh, the Israelite army, uh, basically all of Israel, and oh yeah, by the way, I'm in that too. The fate of, well, pretty much the nation of Israel rests on you, so... Go ahead. Saul must have seen God in David. 38. Then Saul dressed David in his own tunic. He put a coat of armor on him and a bronze helmet on his head. David fastened on his sword over the tunic and tried walking around because he was not used to them. I cannot go in these, he said to Saul, because I'm not used to them. So he took them off. The hero of our story would not look like a hero that we would expect. Verse 40, then he took his staff in his hand, just a stick that he used to direct the sheep, chose five smooth stones from the stream, and some scholars think they were about the size of a tennis ball, okay? So don't think a little pebble, okay? Think the size of a tennis ball. Put them in the pouch of his shepherd's bag, and with his sling in his hand, approached the Philistine. Meanwhile, the Philistine, with his shield bearer in front of him, kept coming closer to David. He looked David over and saw that he was little more than a boy, glowing with health and handsome, and he despised him. He said to David, am I a dog that you come at me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. 
Now, this is really important here, something I've never seen before until I did some research this week. Number one, he's cursing David, but we see here in just a minute he's actually cursing and blaspheming God. I wonder if the Bible has anything to say about when we curse and blaspheme the name of God. Well, first off, Genesis 12, verse 3, God is speaking here, and it says, I will bless those who bless you. So in case anyone's questioning about whether we should um, equip and support Israel, there's one of the many verses right there. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. So right here, Goliath is cursing David, but also cursing God. So number one, David gets basically this curse turned back on him. But watch this. Look at Leviticus chapter 24. This is the law. This is God speaking to Moses and Moses speaking to the people, the law. And it says, say to the Israelites, anyone who curses their God will be held responsible. And again, right there, it just said that he was cursing David. But in a minute, we're going to see he was cursing God and and the, the God of the armies of angel. Anyone who blasphemes the name of the Lord is to be what? Put to death. It gets better. The entire assembly must what? Stone them. How did Goliath die? Isn't that interesting? It's pretty wild how the Bible is true and it means what it says. Pretty cool. Whether foreign or native born, when they blaspheme the name, I love that, they are to be put to death. So back to our passage, verse 44. Come here, he said, this is uh, Goliath, and I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. Now, if not before, this is the exact moment where I would have said, you know, (laughs) I think this was a bad idea. I'm now standing pretty much face to face at this giant. And he says, I'm going to give your flesh to the birds and the beasts. Like your corpse will be rotting and animals will come and eat it. I would have gone, yeah, that's not on my to-do list, so I'm out. Not David. But listen, listen to David's speech. His speech is longer than the battle. But I think that's the point. I think the point of this entire story is David's speech, not what happens. There's a lot of great content in here, but David's speech is the most important thing here, I believe. Verse 45, David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin. Now pause just for a second. Remember that we just read right over that. Remember the size. Remember the gravity of the situation. Remember how big this guy is. And little David, shepherd boy, is saying, you're coming at me with all of your technology and your massive size and all of your experience. That's daunting, okay? You're you're coming at me with that? Okay, fine. But I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. You don't get to do that. You don't get to curse my God. I don't care how big you are. I don't care what you have. You don't get to do that to my God. You have to pay. That was what David was emphasizing here. You don't, no, no, no. Goliath, you don't understand what's going on here. You don't know what you have done. Now watch what he says. This day, the Lord will deliver you into my hands. I I wish I could have been there to hear how he's, see what he's doing. He's turning it. And I I, want to hear his inflection. If he's saying, no, 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 you've got it wrong. Like God's going to deliver you into my hands. And I'll strike you down and cut off your head. Um, David, you don't have a sword. What are you talking about? But see, David's not talking logic. I'm not saying he's talking illogically. I'm saying he's talking through what God is instructing him. He is, he is, God, 
you are in charge here. God, I got nothing except you, and that's everything I need. This very day, listen to what he says, I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals. Now, wait a minute. This is so cool. Goliath said, I'll give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals. David's like, no, 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 that's not good enough. I'm going to one-up you. Not just you, Goliath. I will give the carcasses of your whole army to the birds and the wild beasts. Psh, sup. You know, be that. That's what David's doing here. Can you see him? Uh, that's what it looks like in my head anyway. Okay. He says, I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. And he just takes the microphone and he drops it at that particular moment, okay? Whew. Number three, simple followers of God choose God's glory over everything else. Again, the gravity of the situation. Look at, look at the odds. We've got the final four championship game today, and I think tomorrow, right? T today is ladies. Like, like, we know what odds are, right? The odds are pretty much stacked against David, aren't they? But David's like, no, 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 no. I know my God. I know what my God has told me. I know that my God is faithful no matter what. Simple followers of God choose God's glory over everything else, over circumstance, over whatever it is. I didn't know what word to put in there, so I just put everything. God's glory, nothing else compares. God, I want to honor you with my life. I want to honor you with the circumstance. I want to honor you with my stuff. I want to honor you with every breath of my life over everything else that comes my way. Simple followers of God choose God's glory over everything else. Let's finish this out. 48. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell face down on the ground. Real quick, they've done studies about the speed of, of stones coming out of that type of a slingshot. You know, it was over 100 miles an hour. Can you imagine a stone the size of a tennis ball hitting someone in the head? They've, they've done it before. I won't go into details, but it's awesome, okay? Just saying. <laughs> Verse 50, so David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the sheath. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. I mean, come on, tell me the Bible is boring. That is an incredible story. Just real quick. I got to tell this story. We were having um, Island KX, which is our version of Vacation Bible School. A few years ago, we were having it in the gymnasium, and it was sports-themed. It was awesome. It was great. And one of our daily lessons, uh, and, it, and it came with the packet and everything, was David and Goliath. And so it had a video, and, and I, I, we must have missed it in the video because we didn't realize, but so, okay, so David, Goliath, you know, and it's a cartoon and everything because they didn't have video cameras back then, and uh, I don't know why I had to say that. And so they, they mount up, and they're like, yeah, and a slingshot, and a boom, and a forehead, and he falls down right, and David runs over, he grabs his sword out like this, and he raises the sword up, and I'm like, they are going to cut away from this view, right? And sure enough, the camera kind of you know, moves away, and, 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 it, and you hear this whoosh, right? And that was it. And it was like, oh, that was cool. The very next thing, <laughs> his head goes rolling down, and I go, and one of the kids goes, they cut his head off! <laughs> I think we need to preview our videos a little better. <laughs> We still talk about it. It was years ago. We talk about it to this day. 
I don't know why I said that, but it was funny. When the Philistines saw that their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and to the gates of Ekron. Their dead were strewn along the Sharaim road to Gath and Ekron. And we'll stop there. Simple story, simple truths, simple application. What do we need to know? There's a lot of stuff in the Bible. There's a lot of, a lot of deep stuff. There's a lot of prophecy. There's, a lot, there's things I don't get. And it's a, what are the simple things we need to know here? Number one, simple followers of God choose obedience over status. Number two, simple followers of God choose faith over fear. And number three, simple followers of God choose God's glory over everything else. No matter what you're facing in life, God has called you to something. God has made you promises. God will never leave you nor forsake you. And he wants to walk along with you through life and sometimes scoop you up and carry you because that's all you've got. That's the God that we have. That's the God that I want to follow. He's not simple. I am. And so I need these very simple truths to apply to my life and say, God, I'm yours. What is it that you want from me? Let's pray. God, thank you so much that as much as is wound up in your word, God, you do make it simple for us. God, that you... (laughs) better. I don't know any other way to say it, but God, you call us to a better life. You call us to better circumstances. God, you want so much more for us in this life. God, help us to not get caught up in all of the confusion, all of the the, the junk that happens to us in life. God, God, help us to just kind of push all that aside right now, especially in this moment. God, help us to get back to simple. Help us to get back to basic. God, what is it that you want us to know? God, what what are the truths from your word that you want us to get? God, I just pray that you would speak to us right now in this moment. God, tell us what it is that's our next step. God, reveal to us what fear, what circumstance we are keeping our eyes focused on instead of you. God, help us to choose obedience over status, over what we think we ought to do to further us. God, just help us to obey. God, help us to just be simple, true followers of you. God, I know that some in this room this morning are struggling. Struggling with their faith. Struggling with their circumstances in life. Right now, God, in this moment, in the quiet of this moment, would you just wrap your loving arms around them? Let them know that they don't have to do it alone. God, I know that we don't always get clarity when we want, but God, help us to trust when there is lack of clarity. God, thank you that your love does everything that it can do to pursue us. As we sang just a few minutes ago, God, that your love will just scale any wall. It will do anything to get at us. Thank you that that's the kind of God that you are, that you never turn your back on us, that you love us through everything. You love us in spite of everything that we've done. God, if there are some here this morning who do not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, that they have not accepted Jesus 
as their Savior right now in this moment. Would they just say, Jesus, I want you to be my Lord. Jesus, I give you my life. Save me. Change me. Be my Savior. God, thank you that again, you are so good. Use us, God, in an awesome way. God, use this new series to help us to get back to the basics of what you're calling us to do. God, speak to me and through me that I may charge your congregation to step out into this world in faith and to follow your will in our lives. And God, we pray for this time of offering. God, may we be generous. God, may we be a generous church that reaches out that sees needs and not only sees them, that we meet the needs of people around us. God, help us to meet physical needs in a way that it opens up opportunities for us to meet spiritual needs. God, through our generosity and our giving, God, help us to do things that are gonna matter in 10,000 years. Thank you for your goodness, Lord. We pray all this in the awesome, mighty, powerful name of Jesus. Amen.